You know, as always, subscriptions are appreciated if you like the content here. Appreciate it. So today I'm looking at Moonbase Clavius, which is a capsule game from Task Force Game. It's been a while since I've looked at a Task Force game, so I thought I'd give it a shot. So it's a capsule game, meaning that it comes with the components within the little book here. As with other capsule games, it doesn't include dice. As is typical for Task Force games, it's about 8.5 by 5.5. Fairly detailed rules. Before we get too far into it, it is interesting the um, a similar sci-fi themes kind of carry across games. And I had previously reviewed a game from Yakinto, which is Rain 2002, which is combat during the first Lunar War. Obviously this is from Yakinto and Moonbase Clavius is from Task Force, so there's not a direct tie-in. But it's interesting that this this game is kind of the events that lead that led up to the first Lunar War and they happened in nineteen eighty six, so be curious if this could be used as like a sort of a prequel to Marine two thousand two. Just out of curiosity, I'll check that out. Hard work is functional. Kind of synopsis here in the back of the book. The Soviet attack on the American moon base in the crater Clavius was launched early on October 27th and reached the American base early on October 28th. The Soviets, with the advantage of surprise, were able to accomplish the majority of their initial objectives. The American forces were pushed back to the perimeter of Clavius. The Soviets were now racing against the clock. It was essential to capture the American colonies before the Marines could arrive. They pulled up their nuclear mortars and began da the day-long siege. It's got three scenarios in a campaign game. It says it'll play 30 minutes to an hour. Moderate complexity. Credits. Game design, Kerry Anderson. Game development, Stephen G. Wilcox. Combat system design, Ellen D. Aldridge. Graphics, Arvance Buck. Introduction, Richard L. Buck. Production, Alan D. Eldridge. Rules editing, Alan D. Eldridge and others. Cover painting, Alvin J. Bellflower. And then playtesters. The components. It's got 108 counters. Nothing too fancy, but it's functional. The blue are the American forces and the orange are the Russians. They're all one-sided and they're half inch by half inch. It's unique components. Blue is American, orange is Soviet. You have your combat strength and your movement points. Then your designator of what they are. Soviets have SMG or submachine gun units, or rifle units. They both have nuclear mortars. Americans have infantry, laser rifle, and Americans also have non-nuclear mortars, just standard mortars, and SPBs, which are self-propelled batteries. There's also these engineer units which just have a combat value. There are using the optional rules. They're intended to breach the defenses of American forts and colonies. It's tied to the headquarters unit. Whenever the engineer unit is participating in attack for a colony, one is subtracted from each attack die roll. It's a combat value of five is also used. It always remains in the hex with the headquarters. Then the Soviets have a brigade headquarters, which serves as a combat unit and also as a source of resupply and allows any unit stacked with it to move an extra two X's. 
it's always the last unit in stack to be eliminated. Then of course the engineers are when they're used they're stacked with headquarters. Then you have a game turn marker. So there's a zone of control of the six hexes around the comp around the counter. And infantry, rifle, submachine gun, and laser rifle. And engineers and headquarters don't have range combat, so they can only attack if they're adjacent to the hex. Nuclear mortars, regular mortars, and SPBs have, have range combat. Nuclear mortars and regular mortars do it at their combat value up to with a range of two hexes. SPBs, though, they, they can do it at a range, but they reduce their combat value by a half or five. And also, standard mortars differ, differ from nuclear mortars in that standard mortars, when they're attacking multiple units in a hex, they divide their attacks among those, but nuclear mortars, when they're attacking the hex, they don't divide their attack factor because everything is getting a full effect. Also, there are stacking limitations. The idea being that even though you're playing space and hex, you don't want to stack more than you can't stack more than three and a hex because you want to spread out your defenders in case they're attacked by a nuclear mortar. So the stacking limit is three. Here's the map. Nothing too exciting, but it looks functional. It's about 16 by 22. Each hex is approximately 27.52 kilometers. Actually, I wish the R was a little more elaborate, but we'll see how functional it is. And the different train types can affect movement and potentially combat. These dark gray hexes are crater walls. Crater plane is the light gray. Rough are the clear hexes. Colonies are the, the red circles. Forts are the octagon shaped. Mining facilities have the are the circles with the crosshairs in them. And then the transport system are these red lines interconnecting things. The rule book, 18 pages. Just scanning it, it looks to be you know kind of moderate complexity, as they say. In the book, there's a train effects chart and a combat results table to be used during the play. And a quick overview of how the play goes. Won't go into detail. I'll show that in play. But it's done in game turns and each. During each game turn, there's two player turns, the Soviet and American, of course. And within those, for each player, you have the, the combat phase, the movement phase, reinforcement phase, where you receive any reinforcements specified by the scenario. Then you go to the second player turn. And it's interesting that you do your combat before you move your counters. Here's the train effects chart and combat results table, which show the effective train course. Crater wall, movement cost per X is 3, rough, 2, crater plane, colony, fort, mining facility, movement cost per X is 1, and transport system is covered in the rules. Here's a combat results table by strength points and by a train type. For the attacking units, you add up the attack points of all the units attacking, except for the NM, the nuclear motors, and of all the nu and of all the non-NM attack points, you divide that by the number of defenders in the hex that's being attacked, and then you add the additional attack 
points of the nuclear mortars. You roll two dice, and if the result is the number shown or less, a unit is removed, and you do this roll for each of the defenders in the hex being attacked. I think it's done that way because you know your infantry, etc. Non mortar elements will they'll divide their forces between what's in there, but then the nuclear mortar will just attack everything in the hex. I think that's the rationale. In units in mining colonies are attacked as per other training hex. And when units are on the SPB, the SPB is, counts as the train being used. In the rules, there's four scenarios. There's the initial Soviet attack, it shows the setup. Game length, victory conditions. And then there's the scenario of Siege of Clavius, the scenario of the Marines land. Then a campaign game, where it combines the first three into a complete portrayal of the first three days of the First Lunar War. Then we'll get to set up and play. The scenario I'll be doing is the initial Soviet attack. The Soviet attack was launched on October 27 and reached the American base early on October 28th. The Americans are not aware of the Soviet drive until they were almost on top of the base perimeter. Their force personnel guarding the base immediately sent out a plea for help, and the 1st Marine Specialized Battalion, as well as all American Space Forces, were mobilized. The Americans, however, had no shuttle ready for immediate launch, so the order was sent to the colonists. Hold on as long as possible. Marines will reach Clevius at 0, 100 hours, November 1st. Set up. Game length 7 turns. Victory conditions. The Soviets must capture 4 forts and 1 colony, or all 5 colonies. Here's the initial setup. The U.S. forces are 32 of the infantry. Six of the nuclear mortars and four of the non nuclear mortars. And you put all the forces within the Clavius crater or within three hexes of a mine. And so I've put one infantry and one nuclear mortar in four of the kind of surrounding mine areas. And then the rest are in the the rest are in the Clavius crater, and limited by the stacking limitations, which are three per hex. Generally, I have infantry stacked together, and got some non-nuclear mortars here, and nuclear mortars. So everything besides the one infantry nuclear mortar per the four mines, I'm gonna put in the Clavius crater. Then the Soviet forces, there's 12, use 12 SMGs, 23 rifle, 8 nuclear mortars, 1 headquarter, and the 1 engineer. And they'll all enter on the left map edge on turn one. And the game goes for seven turns. Okay, in the first turn here, so the Soviets will combat and move. And then the Americans will combat and move. There's no reinforcements in this scenario, so we won't do that. Put the game turn marker up there. Interesting part of this is the asymmetric movement. The Americans have this monorail system, and if they start their turn on the monorail, they can move in unlimited amount of spaces on the monorail, but they have to end the turn on the monorail as well. So they can get on and off the monorail at any point. And all the units, Soviet and American, fly. Um, the only ground units are SPBs. And all units that fly don't 
have the movement cost penalty going over the hexes is just one per hex. Um, the movement cost per hex only applies to SPBs, and I'm not using any SPBs in this scenario, so it won't apply. Although the train will affect the defense. And the Soviets can also go in there and try to blow up the monorail sections, and if that's the case, then the Americans can't use that section. The Soviets combat, and everything's out of range, so there's no everything's out of range, so there's no combat yet. They're not ranged weapons aren't within two X's, and everything else isn't adjacent, so they'll do the movement. And now, what they'll do, they'll attack these kind of mine outposts here and see if they can overwhelm them. And then they'll also try to flank and then put some up in the middle here to kind of surround these sections. And all, all units are air units except for SPBs and air units go have a movement loans of 10 and they're not encumbered by the movement cost penalties and train. Only SPB are. Only SPBs are and I'm not using SPBs in this scenario. But when they get, when they enter a zone of control of an enemy unit, they have to expend two more movement points. And zones of control are the six hexes around an enemy unit. So we'll move this one in. One, two, three, four, five, six. Here we go seven, but then it's seven plus eight, nine. He couldn't quite make it there. Yeah, so he'll back off here. He doesn't want to be in range of that mortar. He'll stay back here so they're beyond the two hex range. And he'll send these guys down a flank. You can attack him because he's within the range there. Then we'll have headquarters and the engineer kind of stay back. Stack with him. See if these guys can get in range. So he can, he can get in range. So well, it's him. Yeah, stacking limitations are, you know, three per per stack. He's outside the zone of control, so he doesn't have to expend those extra two points yet. Same there. Stair movement. You know, the American forces go. As far as combat, there's nothing in range. This is, they're all beyond two range. They're all beyond a range of two hexes, so they can't fire yet. Same here. Then they'll do movement. Kind of fly over here to meet the guys. He'll put these, uh, he's got a mortar here, I'll put on the monorail. He'll just end on his turn there, and the on the next turn he can take the monorail where he wants to go. He'll be in range of him next time. He'll go on the monorail as well. 
and go out here to meet these guys. The best train for defending seems to be if you're in a fort or colony, and after that to be in a crater wall. So he'll go up in a crater wall. As well he'll heal. He'll have moved up there too. So then we move down the game turn track. We're on the second turn now. It's not a lot of options for combat yet. He could go against a nuclear mortar here up in the crater wall. But on the combat re resolution table, you'd need, uh, he only has four strength points, and that you can't hit him. But if he goes to the crater plane, he could hit with a three or less. And if, if he had uh, other units here, you divide those the attack force by the number of units in the hex you're attacking, but you don't do that for nuclear mortars. They get the all the ones in there get the full effect, and there's only one anyway. He misses. There's nothing else in range down here. Up here, there's a few in range. These three nuclear mortars can go against him, he's on a crater plane, so he's got a three or less. Nope. So on the final one, he hits him and he's gone. Got lucky. That's all the combat they can do, because the others aren't adjacent, and nuclear mortars aren't within a range of two hexes. And he moves. He's gonna. He'll keep that nuclear mortar there, but move this one here so he's got eight points next time. Move him up as well. So we can add on to them. They're gonna move up here to this nuclear mortar. See if they can get him next turn. He'll keep going back here. He'll move in. He'll move in. The engineer and headquarters will stay back here. He'll move in. These will move in range. And they'll stack them up too. Get adjacent to this nuclear mortar. So again, you take two more movement points to get into the zone of control, but they had plenty. So one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. These guys will move down here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That'll be his movement. Then the American player will do combat. He'll he'll do his nuclear mortar. Against this hex. They're in the crater wall though, so they can't hit them in the crater wall. Same with these. He's in the crater plane. So he can 
both these are in range, but he'll uh, he actually go against these machine gun guys. It's a range, but they have more power, um, which is interesting. You don't ha count their combat, the defensive combat in combat. It's only the combat the attacker. And it's got a range of two. And he gets to fire at each of them. And there's three in the hex. Misses. Misses. Hits. Hits one of them. It's gone. And each unit can only attack once, and each unit can also only be attacked once, too. Uh, now he's going to go, he's adjacent to both of them. He's got a power of six, and he's partially on the crater wall, so you can't do as being the crater wall. He's in crater plane. Five to six, he needs a three or less. No. Nope. These are out of range, he's in range. He's on the crater plane, he's on the crater wall, so we can't hit him since he only has four combat strength. But these three nuclear motors are sitting here in the rough area. Um, unfortunately, in the rough area also, he can't hit on a strength of four, so they're fortunate there. I guess they planned that. These are adjacent. And they're three infantry with a strength of six each, so they're 18. And you divide that then by the number of units in the defender's hex, which is there's three of them, so it's six. And they're in a crater wall, five to six on a crater wall. They need a two or less, gets three shots. Nope. Up here, he's not in range. He's in range. It's on a crater plane here. Got a strength of four. He's going... against the stack. He's technically only doing one attack, but since he launches in that hex, it can potentially affect each of them. Kind of a multiplier effect there. Um, so he needs, again, it's on a plane, the, in the crater plane. So he needs a three or less. Nope. Still firing. These are adjacent. So there's three of these at six each. So he's at 18. He's firing against three in that. X because they're adjacent. So again, six. They're in the crater plane. In the crater plane with a six, you need three or less. Hit. So one's gone. Roll for next. Nope. Nope. And lastly, the nuclear mortar. I think you went already. This nuclear mortar. Go against him. He's in a crater plane. Three or less. There's three of them in the stack. Missed. 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 Now the American forces move. And steel is at. So we got these guys on the monorail. They can go as far as they want. He'll go all the way up here. So he's in range of him. Similarly, he'll go all the way up here to, to stack with him. These guys are on the monorail as well. They'll go over here to support these guys. They can't get off the monorail this turn though. I'll stay back here to defend. He'll move up just a bit. Go on the crater wall. They'll be in the 
They'll take up defensive positions on the crater wall. He's within range of him now. Hopefully that gives you some sense of the play. So that's my look at Moonbase Clavius from Test Force Games from 1982. I can't say it's uh, one of my favorite games. Um, I think Test Force is much better games out there. Um, like for instance, War of the Worlds is one and there's several others, you know, Starfire, etc. If you're a completist like me and you're looking forward to completing your or working towards completing your Task Force game collection, it'd be good to get a copy. It's pretty reasonable to get out there. But for me, it didn't... Uh, I realize it's like kind of short, meant to be a short game and it fulfills that that uh, goal. Um, it has some interesting asymmetric thoughts as far as how the Soviet forces can move compared to how the Americans do. Weapons, pretty similar, a little bit of variation. Um, there wasn't enough, enough complexity to hold my interest. I think uh, if you're looking, if you like that idea of the American Soviets battle on the lunar surface, I think Marine 2002 from Yakinto is a good way to go. I I reviewed that one a while back. It's and that's actually one of my first reviews I did, so that one might be a little bit of a rough review. You can check that out. That'd be great. Um, and Marine 2002. Last I checked in eBay, you can get a you can get them at a pretty reasonable price. So definitely recommend that. This one, you know, if you want to complete your collection, it's fine. It is interesting that. Both Marine 2002 in this game, this one's from 1982, and Marine 2002 came out maybe a little bit after this one. But this is talking about a war in 1996. It's interesting how optimistic we were in those days. Uh, I guess optimistic is an interesting way of looking at it, but saying that, you know, 14 years after this game was released, they're projecting that a feasible scenario people might be interested in was war on the lunar surface. So it's kind of interesting, kind of the, I guess, dystopian optimism there, sort of. Anyway, glad I looked at it. As always, subscriptions are appreciated. I'll give, it, I'll give that a, uh, I'll give it a 5 out of 10. Um, thanks a lot.